The three-age system in archaeology and physical anthropology is the periodization of human prehistory and history into three consecutive time periods, named for their respective tool-making technologies, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, origin. The concept of dividing prehistorical ages into systems based on metals extends far back in European history, but the present archaeological system of the three main ages, stone, bronze and iron, originates with the Danish archaeologist Christian Jurgensen Thomson, who placed the system on a more scientific basis by typological and chronological studies, at first of tools and other artifacts present in the Museum of Northern Antiquities in Copenhagen. He later used artifacts and the excavation reports published or sent to him by Danish archaeologists who were doing controlled excavations. His position as curator of the museum gave him enough visibility to become highly influential on Danish archaeology. A well-known and well-liked figure, he explained his system in person to visitors at the museum, many of them professional archaeologists. The metallic ages of Hesiod in his poem, Works and Days, the ancient Greek poet Hesiod possibly between 750 and 650 BC, defined five successive ages of man, one, golden, silver, bronze, heroic and five, iron. Only the Bronze Age and the Iron Age are based on the use of metal. Then Zeus the father created the third generation of mortals, the Age of Bronze. They were terrible and strong, and the ghastly action of Ares was theirs, and violence. The weapons of these men were bronze, of bronze their houses, and they worked as bronze smiths. There was not yet any black iron, Hesiod knew from the traditional poetry, such as the Iliad, and the heirloom bronze artifacts that abounded in Greek society, that before the use of iron to make tools and weapons, bronze had been the preferred material and iron was not smelted at all. He did not continue the manufacturing metaphor, but mixed his metaphors, switching over to the market value of each metal. Iron was cheaper than bronze, so there must have been a golden and a silver age. He portrays a sequence of metallic ages, but it is a degradation rather than a progression. Each age has less of a moral value than the preceding. Of his own age, he says, and I wish that I were not any part of the fifth generation of men, but had died before it came, or had been born afterward. The progress of Lucretius The moral metaphor of the ages of metals continued. Lucretius, however, replaced moral degradation with the concept of progress which he conceived to be like the growth of an individual human being. The concept is evolutionary, for the nature of the world as a whole is altered by age. Everything must pass through successive phases. Nothing remains forever what it was. Everything is on the move. Everything is transformed by nature and forced into new paths. The earth passes through successive phases, so that it can no longer bear what it could. And it can now what it could not before. The Romans believed that the species of animals, including man, were spontaneously generated from the materials of the earth because of which the Latin word mater, mother, descends to English speakers as matter and material. In Lucretius the earth is a mother, Venus, to whom the poem is dedicated in the first few lines. She brought forth mankind by spontaneous generation, a view that, removed to the molecular stage, and stripped of its anthropomorphism, is the same as in today's biological chemistry. Having been given birth as a species, man must grow to maturity by analogy with individual men. The different phases of their collective life are marked by the accumulation of customs to form material civilization. The earliest weapons were hands, nails and teeth. Next came stones and branches wrenched from trees, and fire and flame as soon as these were discovered. Then men learnt to use tough iron and copper, 
With copper they tilled the soil, with copper they whipped up the clashing waves of war, then by slow degrees the iron sword came to the fore, the bronze sickle fell into disrepute, the plowman began to cleave the earth with iron. Lucretius envisioned a pre-technological man that was far tougher than the men of today. They lived out their lives in the fashion of wild beasts roaming at large. The next stage was the use of huts, fire, clothing, language and the family. City-states, kings and citadels followed them. Lucretius supposes that the initial smelting of metal occurred accidentally in forest fires. The use of copper followed the use of stones and branches and preceded the use of iron. Early lithic analysis by Michel Mercator by the 16th century, a tradition had developed based on observational incidents, true or false, that the black objects found widely scattered in large quantities over Europe had fallen from the sky during thunderstorms and were therefore to be considered generated by lightning. They were so published by Conrad Jessner in De Rerum Fossilium, Lapidum A. Gemarum Maxim Figurish and Similitudinibus at Zurich in 1565 and by many others less famous. The name Saraunia, Thunderstones, had been assigned. Saraunia were collected by many persons over the centuries including Michel Mercator, superintendent of the Vatican Botanical Garden and in the late 16th century. He brought his collection of fossils and stones to the Vatican, where he studied them at leisure, compiling the results in a manuscript, which was published posthumously by the Vatican at Rome in 1717 as Metallothica. Mercata was interested in Saraunia cunita, wedge-shaped thunderstones, which seemed to him to be most like axes and arrowheads which he now called Saraunia vulgaris, folk thunderstones, distinguishing his view from the popular one. His view was based on what may be the first in-depth lithic analysis of the objects in his collection, which led him to believe that they are artifacts and to suggest that the historical evolution of these artifacts followed a scheme. Mercator examining the surfaces of the Saraunia noted that the stones were of flint and that they had been chipped all over by another stone to achieve by percussion their current forms. The protrusion at the bottom, he identified as the attachment point of a haft. Concluding that these objects were not Saraunia, he compared collections to determine exactly what they were. Vatican collections included artifacts from the New World of exactly the shapes of the supposed Saraunia. The reports of the explorers had identified them to be implements and weapons or parts of them. Mercat posed the question to himself, why would anyone prefer to manufacture artifacts of stone rather than of metal, a superior material? His answer was that metallage was unknown at that time. He cited biblical passages to prove that in biblical times stone was the first material used. He also revived the three-age system of Lucretius, which described a succession of periods based on the use of stone, bronze and iron respectively. Due to lateness of publication, Mercati's ideas were already being developed independently, however, his writings served as a further stimulus. The usages of Mahoudal and Ayutu on November 12, 1734, Nicholas Mahoudal, physician, antiquarian and numismatist. Read a paper at a public sitting of the Académie Royale des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres in which he defined three usages of stone bronze and iron in a chronological sequence. He had presented the paper several times that year, but it was rejected until the November revision was finally accepted and published by the Academy. In 1740, it was entitled Les Monuments Les Plus Anciens de l'Industrie des Hommes et des Arts Reconnues dans les Pierres de Fordresse. It expanded the concept of Antoine de Utu, who had gotten a paper accepted in 1723 entitled De l'Origine Aide as Usages de la Pierre de Forderie. In Mahoudal, there is not just one usage for stone, but two more, one each for bronze and iron. He begins his treatise with descriptions and classifications of the Pierres de Tonnerre de Forderie, the Saraunia of contemporaneous European interest. After cautioning the audience that natural and man-made objects so often easily confused, 
He asserts that the specific figures, or formies that can be distinguished, of the stones were man-made, not natural. It was man's hand that made them serve as instruments, their cause, he asserts is the industry of our forefathers. He adds later that bronze and iron implements imitate the uses of the stone wands, suggesting a replacement of stone with metals. Mahoodle is careful not to take credit for the idea of a succession of usages in time but states, it is Michel Mercatus, position of Clement VIII who first had this idea. He does not coin the term for ages but speaks only of the times of usages. His use of l'industry foreshadows the 20th century industries, but where the moderns mean specific tool traditions. Mahoodle meant only the art of working stone and metal in general. The three-age system of C. J. Thompson An important step in the development of the three-age system came when the Danish antiquarian Christian Jurgensen Thompson was able to use the Danish National Collection of Antiquities and the records of their finds as well as reports from contemporaneous excavations to provide a solid, empirical basis for the system. He showed that artifacts could be classified into types and that these types varied over time in ways that correlated with the predominance of stone, bronze or iron implements and weapons. In this way he turned the three-age system from being an evolutionary scheme based on intuition and general knowledge into a system of relative chronology supported by archaeological evidence. Initially, the three-age system as it was developed by Thomson and his contemporaries in Scandinavia, such as Sven Nielsen and J.J.A. Worse R.A., was grafted onto the traditional biblical chronology. But during the 1830s they achieved independence from textual chronologies and relied mainly on typology and stratigraphy. In 1816 Thomson at age 27 was appointed to succeed the retiring Rasmus Nyrup as secretary of the Congolija Commission for Old Sages of Averung, which had been founded in 1807. The post was unsalaried. Thomson had independent means. At his appointment Bishop Munter said that he was an amateur with a great range of accomplishments. Between 1816 and 1819 he reorganized the Commission's collection of antiquities. In 1819 he opened the first Museum of Northern Antiquities, in Copenhagen, in a former monastery, to house the collections. It later became the National Museum. Like the other antiquarians, Thomson undoubtedly knew of the three-age model of prehistory through the works of Lucretius, the Dane Vidal Simonson, Montfaucon and Mahoodle. Sorting the material in the collection chronologically he mapped out which kinds of artifacts co-occurred in deposits and which did not, as this arrangement would allow him to discern any trends that were exclusive to certain periods. In this way he discovered that stone tools did not co-occur with bronze or iron in the earliest deposits while subsequently bronze did not co-occur with iron, so that three periods could be defined by their available materials, stone, bronze and iron. To Thomson the fine circumstances were the key to dating. In 1821 he wrote in a letter to fellow prehistorian Schroeder, Nothing is more important than to point out that hitherto we have not paid enough attention to what was found together, and in 1822, we still do not know enough about most of the antiquities either. Only future archaeologists may be able to decide but they will never be able to do so if they do not observe what things are found together and our collections are not brought to a greater degree of perfection. This analysis emphasizing co-occurrence and systematic attention to archaeological context allowed Thompson to build a chronological framework of the materials in the collection and to classify new finds in relation to the established chronology, even without much knowledge of their provenience. In this way, Thomson's system was a true chronological system rather than an evolutionary or technological system. Exactly when his chronology was reasonably well established is not clear, but by 1825 visitors to the museum were being instructed in his methods. In that year also he wrote to J.G.G. Bushing, 
to put artifacts in their proper context I consider it most important to pay attention to the chronological sequence. And I believe that the old idea of first stone, then copper, and finally iron, appears to be ever more firmly established as far as Scandinavia is concerned. By 1831 Thomson was so certain of the utility of his methods that he circulated a pamphlet. Scandinavian artifacts and the preservation, advising archaeologists to observe the greatest curve to note the context of each artifact. The pamphlet had an immediate effect. Results reported to him confirmed the universality of the three-age system. Thomson also published in 1832 and 1833 articles in the Nordisk Tide Skrift for Old Kundide. Scandinavian Journal of Archaeology, he already had an international reputation when in 1836 the Royal Society of Northern Antiquaries published his illustrated contribution to Guide to Scandinavian Archaeology, in which he put forth his chronology together with comments about typology and stratigraphy. Thomson was the first to perceive typologies of grave goods, grave types, methods of burial, pottery and decorative motifs, and to assign these types to layers found in excavation. His published and personal advice to Danish archaeologists concerning the best methods of excavation produced immediate results that not only verified his system empirically but placed Denmark in the forefront of European archaeology for at least a generation. He became a national authority when CCRAFN, Secretary of the Congolige Nordiska Oldskrift Selskab, published his principal manuscript in Ledertrad till Nordisk Old Kin died in 1836. The system has since been expanded by further subdivision of each era, and refined through further archaeological and anthropological finds.